Hello, everyone. Hey, Janet. Hey, Maria, how are you doing? Good. Good.
Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Okay. Just getting online. Good to see you guys. All right. Who do we have on board here? Hi, Tiffany. Hello. Uh, let's see. Is it just you, you and I in, in ETAC crime? Is that what, so far, is that just us? Um, kind of looks that way. Yeah, I did get a text from Chris. He said he'll be about five minutes late. So he'll he'll be joining us also, but um, yeah, I, I didn't hear anything from Patrick or from or from Greg. I think we'll be here. Yeah, my guess. So Tiffany, I have to ask you. You're an avid cyclist, uh, uh -huh. from what I've gathered. But yeah. I'm always curious. I know Greg is too, and. Um, kind of looking at the forecast this weekend. Yep. Are, are, are you guys pushing it even, even in this, this um, time of year, this climate? Yeah, I, I still plan on riding every day. It'll be fine. <laughs> well, that's, that's impressive. That's I have a lot of experience. Day. I have my have all my layers. I do it as well too, but I do have my limits, and I think this weekend I might reach it. Your what? I'm sorry, I missed that. Yeah, it is supposed to be awfully cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so maybe maybe I saw I'll just a couple forecasts that said drink. that it was going to be like seven degrees this weekend. So I think that might be a little chilly um, being exposed. Yeah, um, you just have to have a lot of layers. <laughs> ah, there you go. All right. Well, if if you do if you do go that route, Tiffany, just take a selfie because I'd be impressed. But you could set, put put it up on our ETAC page <laughs> or whatever else. So I think that's pretty good. Yeah, I've been biking. I bike every morning, and <laughs> yes. uh, it's been yeah. chill, it's been a chilly week. <laughs> I imagine, yeah. I stay, still made it out, made some rounds kind of in the neighborhood and in the park and all that. But yeah, it's just, I think, uh, like I said, this, this weekend, it's those those single digits, they get to me. I figured I might as well just go like snowboarding than if it's, you know, whatever that. that right, cold right. Or something, so yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, yeah, so I... Still looking to see if um, Greg or Patrick might be joining us, but I don't. I don't. They haven't messaged me or anything yet. So, hey, Lorraine. Actually, this is Nancy. I'm filling in for a bit. Oh, okay. I, was, you, I just you, you just turned name across. So, how many? That's are, all right. How many are on the commission? Oh, here's. Uh, well, we have five in an alternate alternate member, although the alternate member is not showing up, hasn't been showing up. Um, okay. So go ahead. No, no, that's fine. Thank you. I was just wondering. Yeah. I'll just, so, just keep bringing them all in. Sure, sure. As they come, so. Just let me know when you have a quorum. This is one I'll... meeting. I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say that, that this would be one meeting where I'd like to have quorum because we've got quite a bit of uh, agenda items to cover here. Um, so you just let me know when you have a quorum have and then I'll turn it over to uh, Maria. Sounds good. Thanks, Nancy. Of course. If we, do, uh, Nancy? Yes. So if we do get to that, if, if we do have a quorum and we move on with the meeting, uh, could you, what typically what Lorraine does is just do the roll call for us. Um, oh. She just calls out the member names. If you can't, that's fine as well, too, because I don't know if you're. If I'm you know, sorry, I don't know your member names. I would yeah, I, I'll, that's I'll do that, Neil. Yeah. Okay. And if you have any sorry. votes, uh, take any uh, votes during the meeting, I can do that. 
All right. Thanks, Maria. Yeah. Thank you. I apologize. No problem. Well, Maria, I hate I hate to to uh, move ahead, but I, I just want to say that I have a picture, and when we a few pictures when we get to it about the snow removal, so uh, it's very timely. But uh, just by dumb luck, I happened to be on Dartmouth and and caught the caught the uh, the city ops guys, maintenance guys, just cleaning up some ice and everything. So I I try I snapped some pictures as fast as I could while I was at the stoplight there. So okay, but it, great. Was, it was looking much better. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Greg's here. Hello, okay. member Ken Edison. Hello. Sorry, I had to get my dinner. Understood. That makes for a rough meeting if you you don't if you're not fed there and and got your energy there, Greg. So good to see you. We're we've got pretty much a quorum right now. Although uh, Chris had texted me that he would be about five minutes late. I think we're just about there. We can begin and uh, and then I guess just have Chris join us if that sounds all, all right with everyone. Okay. Okay, very good. Um, Nancy, if you're ready, are, are we already recording? I guess we are, huh? Yep, you, you are okay. recording. Okay, great. So I'll stay on for a little bit and wait for your next, his name is Chris, I'll wait for him. And if not, I'll just turn it over to Maria. Okay. Okay, all right. Okay, let's, uh, let's get underway here, so. Uh, this is the City of Inglewood, Inglewood Transportation Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, today's date is Thursday, February 11, 2021. The time is 6.06 .06 p.m. And I'd like to get started here. First item on our agenda is Chair Sarno's approval of the agenda, which I did do uh, earlier in the week. And I apologize, just, Chair, but uh, Mr. Dietrich just entered the meeting, so okay, uh, great. You should have your quorum now and ready to proceed. So, okay, Maria, I will make you host now. Enjoy Thank your you. meeting. Thanks, Nancy. All right. Hi, Chris. If you're there. Hello, Neil. Hello, everyone. Hi. All right. We've got a quorum, and and we're just ready to jump into it, Chris. There he is. Yeah. Uh, so we'll start off here with the with the roll call. And second all right, here. Chair Sarno. Present. Member O'Connell. Present. Member Dietrich. Present. Member Lewis. Member Kananison. Present. Thank you. You have a quorum. All right, very good. Thanks, Director D'Andrea. Sorry, one question. Um, is sure. Go ahead. Uh, and Member Plasters, I don't think is here, but um, should I mean? Oh, we, I don't know if we need to make note. Call of her name. Yeah, okay. I guess. Yeah, alternate Member Plasters. Right. Thank you. You have a quorum, Chair. All right. Thank you. Uh, so our first item of business is a. Approval of minutes from our January 14th meeting. Uh, if the committee's had the opportunity to review those minutes. And at this time, if they have an, any comments to offer, we have a motion to approve the minutes if they've had an opportunity to review. I believe last last meeting was a little slimmer than what we've got going on this this month. So, but again, this is the opportunity to to speak your piece. 
there's anything that uh, you see is incorrect or would you'd like to add? Okay. I don't have any changes or modifications. Very good. Do we have a an, do we have a motion to approve the minutes from January that was 14th, I believe. I motion to approve minutes from the previous meeting of Inglewood Transportation Advisory Committee. Very good. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. Thank you, Member Canadison. And with that, we'll go for we'll go for discussion. Anything further? Here's we do not at this time, so we can move on to the to the vote. Okay. Chair Sarno. Aye. Member O'Connell. Aye. Member Diedrich. Aye. Member Lewis. Member Canadison? Aye. And alternate member Plasters. Okay. That motion passes for nothing. Very good. Thank you, Director D'Andrea. So let's move on to our next item of business here. Okay. And the next item on the agenda is a Floyd Place cut through traffic concern. Uh, this was brought to the committee's attention, I believe it was two or three months ago uh, by Mr. Tom Sanders, a citizen uh, in the community there that I believe lived off of Floyd Place. Correct. Um, yeah. And so his concerns were regarding some of the cut through traffic that was coming off of university there and into the neighborhood, uh, both on Floyd Place and Floyd Avenue. And so he wanted the city to look into that, perhaps do some traffic counts and just gather some information as to the traffic volumes going through there and um, what possibly can be done if, if necessary. So uh, with that, Director D'Andrea, you have your a memo that's, that's here. Uh, would you like to walk us through that? Sure. Yeah, there's a lot of data here. So I'll start with the map just to orient you. University Avenue is north and south. And then the counts that we took were on Floyd Avenue, which runs east-west and tees out to University. And then Floyd Place, which is this little L here that comes off of Floyd Avenue and also exits, enters off of University Avenue. So we took counts there over a seven day period. And so um, I'll walk you through what we found. This area down here is also a dead end street that comes up to, you can either go to Floyd Place or to Floyd Avenue. So altogether, um, the homes that come off of Floyd Place are about just under, uh, just under 60. So about 58 homes actually use this roadway primarily to access their home. And obviously Floyd Avenue gathers from a much larger area. So you can see that reflected, I'll start here at the top with the total counts. Um, we took both, we separated by both eastbound and westbound because I think that was a concern as well. And on average over that one week period, um, Floyd Avenue has about 817 cars and just during the weekday, it's about 845 and 749 in the weekends. This is very typical of a residential street, um, even of a semi-collector, these volumes. And really nothing surprising there. I'm gonna scroll down a little bit um, to Floyd Place and you can see that the totals here in, in comparison are quite less. So 149, for that seven day period, that same seven day period on Floyd Place and Monday through Friday, just a titch higher and a little bit lower on Saturday and Sunday. The real difference is the eastbound and westbound splits. So again, I'll go back up to Floyd Avenue. You can see that 60, roughly a little over 60% of the traffic is going eastbound. Um, that's consistent throughout each day, and then it is consistent both um, 
in, during the weekday period and the weekend period. So, and then westbound so coming into the neighborhood is less. And so I think that's um, not totally surprising because I can see a lot of people using, especially to the north of Floyd Avenue, probably coming down to Floyd Avenue and then taking a right out onto university to continue to go further south. Um, the neighborhoods probably to the south are gonna then come back up and that those would be the folks who might go north off of there. As you recall, neither intersection has a signal. So making a left, especially in peak periods is probably sometimes difficult to do just because of the volumes on University Avenue. We also looked at, um, so then just looking at Floyd Place with that same split, it was much more even. So it was, um, here we are a little bit less eastbound than westbound. So we've got more people coming into that area, again, probably accessing those 58 homes. So they're not necessarily using Floyd Place to go up in, uh, to Floyd Avenue and go to other areas. So then we'll talk about, we also took, um, we just looked at when is that peak period of traffic. So on Floyd Avenue, I uh, looked at the one hour total that we counted in 15 minute increments and then took the peak hour um, of each of those days. And you can see it, it ranges, but roughly in that hundred uh, vehicles per hour. So that's a one hour period. And it's, typically looks like for 11 a.m. is the most common time period. So that'd be from 11 to noon is when you're seeing that peak period. In the evening, it looks like it's typically about four o'clock. So again, uh, the, the morning might be a little bit different, I would say, and you know, we are during COVID, um, but this would be more typical of that 7 a.m. So catching those peak periods for people coming and going to, to and from work. So that's a little bit different there. But in reality, so again, about 100 vehicles per hour, a little bit higher in the PM, is very typical of um, a residential street. We'll get into speed next. Let me just look at Floyd Place with that same data. So you can see over an hour period, that's a little bit earlier with at Floyd Place, 8, 9, 10 o'clock and then the volumes go down significantly. So it's only 24 to 27, or here there's 31 cars in a total hour on Floyd Place. In the evening, it's a little bit higher. Friday was a little bit, um, maybe an anomaly there, but it can range across the board of when that peak period is when you're getting about 30 to 40 cars per um, in that peak hour. So again, nothing really stood out to us. And then the speed data, we looked again, looking both eastbound and westbound. So again, this is Floyd Avenue and the eastbound was the greater volumes coming out to university on Floyd Avenue. And so you, we looked here, when's that um, peak time in the morning of when's the most cars going in the eastbound direction. And what was a little surprising here is this is the percentage of cars that are either going 30 or greater. So that is um, a residential street. It's not, there are no signs out there, but it is 30 because it's de facto 30 miles per hour on Floyd Avenue. And you can see that's a fairly high amount, but here on Thursday and Friday during these two periods, it's 84 to 83% of cars are going more than 30 miles per hour. Um, the times do range. But this will help to really look at when, you know, maybe if we're going to do some targeted enforcement, when that right time is to do that. Similarly, in the evening, so this was the morning period. Here's the evening period, so afternoon. Typically, looks like 2 to 4 o'clock. Um, the counts are higher here. But again, we're seeing, like, here's one for 88% of vehicles are going higher than 30 miles per hour. Um, so again, wanted to target maybe some of those times to do some speed uh, enforcement. Overall, for the Floyd, Floyd Avenue, excuse me, the average speed was 29 miles per hour, so roughly, so 
That means roughly half the cars are going under 29 and half are going over. And within that 10 mile pace, so between 26 and 35, that captured about 65% of the, all the vehicles, both eastbound and westbound were in that 10 mile range. The 85th percentile speed was 34 miles per hour. And what that means is we want that 85th, that 85% of the cars are going within the speed limit roughly. So this is a little high. Um, and again, this is a little bit higher of a number here where the 37% of vehicles exceeded 30 miles per hour. So let's look at the, oh, excuse me, that was eastbound. Here's westbound, sorry, we did break it down. So westbound, it got much lower. So there was fewer cars going more than 30 miles per hour. So um, especially here in the evening hours, those percentages are well within what we might expect on any given street. So it's really that eastbound traffic, maybe trying to get out in the morning, trying they're on, they're starting their route, trying to get a, a rush on the day and probably speeding a little bit too fast on Floyd Avenue. A question Bell, here, Director yeah. DeAndrea. Mm -hmm. on, um, on Floyd Avenue, I believe that there is a speed limit sign posted that makes it 30 miles an hour, but then Floyd Place as an unposted residential street, shouldn't that now be 25 miles an hour? It should, um, but I don't think we've communicated that very well. But you, yeah, oh, I'm, I missed that then. I went out there. I didn't see the 30 miles per hour sign. Okay. I, I, I just looked it up on Google Maps. It's at like oh, okay. 20, 2091 East Floyd, roughly. Um, okay. But um, I was just thinking, I was just curious, like if, you know, looking at this analysis of 15% of vehicles exceeded 30 miles per hour, mm -hmm. should the benchmark there be 30 um, or would that be 25 as the speed limit on Floyd Place? Yeah, so we did both. Uh, this is still, excuse me, I misspoke. So we're still on westbound um, Floyd Avenue. Okay, okay. And then okay, I'll thank get you. to Floyd Place next. But to your answer your question, we did look at the 25 mile per hour limit for um, Floyd Place as well. Got it, thank you. Okay. Um, so just westbound, again, just summarizing there, we don't see an issue as far as speeding. You know, the counts are much lower and the percent of vehicles going more than 30 miles per hour is much less. And that's reflected in this data where the, you can see that average speed goes down to 26 miles per hour and that 10 mile, that pace speed or that 10 mile gap is lower and that 76% now are within that range. So we feel comfortable with that those um, vehicles are all traveling um, within the, relatively within the speed limit. So for Floyd Place, we'll go down to the speed data for eastbound. So again, this is going out to university. Again, very, very low count. So almost to the point where it was hard for me to pick what that peak time period was. Um, so very, pretty low data here. Again, we don't see an issue eastbound as far as the speed. We did look at that over 25 miles per hour too. And it, it um, goes up maybe a little bit but not too much. So I think while 6% of the vehicles exceeded 30 miles per hour, I should have added this in here, it was almost up to maybe 12% for those going over 25. So again, well within what we would feel comfortable with in terms of that there's not a speeding issue out there. Um, here again, you see that the speed drops even more significantly. That average speed is down to 22 miles per hour now. And that pace speed is again good with 61% of the vehicles going in the range, but that also means that some of that 39% could be under 21 too. So we saw a fair amount of traffic even at the lower end be behind, below this 21 mile speed, which was good. And then westbound um, goes up a little bit, but again, these percentages can be a little deceiving because we're dealing with such small numbers of vehicles. So when we talk about 50% being more than 30, that's four of eight. Um, so we're only dealing with a count of eight. And then here for the 25 mile per hour speed, it went up to about 18% of vehicles exceeded 25 miles per hour overall for the westbound data. So a little bit higher than eastbound, but still well within what we would feel comfortable with. 
So as we say here, it looks at um, the volumes on Floyd Place when compared to Floyd Avenue are significantly less. And even Floyd Place is at the very low end of any residential street, just because it is more of a, almost like a, not quite a dead end, but definitely it's probably attracting mostly people who are on the, in those 58 homes. Um, the directional split is a little bit higher on Floyd Avenue where they're going more to the east than from the west, but not anything out of the normal. The speed data on Floyd Avenue is higher than that 85th percentile in the eastbound direction. And so we're recommending that the police department conduct some targeted enforcement there. And that would be here on Floyd Avenue going out to university. And it's probably between these ranges of seven to 11 and two to five. So with that, happy to answer any other questions. Okay, does the, does the group have anything? I Right now, just um, Director D'Andrea, my first question is, has the city contacted Mr. Sanders to tell him or inform him of these results? Has he been notified or any communication from the city to him? I told him that I was working on it a couple of weeks ago. I left him a voicemail, but I have not reached out to him with the results yet. Okay, that's fine. I just just curious to see if he's if there's been some contact, which apparently there has, and that's mm -hmm. good. So yeah. Uh, Maria, I was curious if the city um, had any further thoughts on um, maybe banning left-hand turns from Fort Floyd Place onto northbound um, University right there. Um, I don't, we, uh, we had previously taken counts at those intersections and the mm -hmm. northbound lefts weren't significant. Okay. Um, we can you know, consider that, but I don't think we saw a pattern of accidents there, nor a huge volume that would maybe okay. like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. There was um, a uh, set of like proposed designs or um, sort of like initial work, I guess, that um, the city engineer Norris had prepared about putting in a couple of different uh, engineering changes to, I think, Floyd Avenue. Um, <clears throat> and I just, you know, what my, my reaction when I saw this was that that feels like it um, provide like that this data provides a pretty good case for why those kinds of changes would be important um, and valuable. And I was just curious what the status was of those. And if, if you know, you feel like this has any, um, uh, like if it pushes you in any direction on whether or not those are important changes. Yeah, I think so. It, it definitely shows, the data shows that Floyd Avenue, as we suspected, was the main collector, if you will, for the neighborhood. Um, and we want to encourage and continue to encourage traffic then to use Floyd Avenue as opposed to Floyd Place. So I believe he was looking at, you know, doing a, trying to make this a, a dedicated left-hand turn in the northbound direction. And I think we will um, continue to look at that and put that in the, um, consider that as part of our capital improvement pro pro program, excuse me, in the near future here. Got it. And I, I guess the other thing I was thinking about is just like uh, um, sort of on the left-hand side of your drawing there is the um, recently improved Packy Romans Park. Mm -hmm. um, and so just the idea that uh, the 85th percentile is at 35 or something like that, or like just that, you know, there's a lot yeah. of cars that are traveling pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Um, and that we've got, you know, there's a ton of kids around that park headed to the park. Um, and, and so that feels like a pretty high speed for people to be going in a 30 mile an hour zone, um, so close to a public amenity, like a park. Um, so I was thinking more about some of the, um, concrete installations in the middle of the road designed more for slowing mm -hmm. down traffic, uh, particularly around the park. Yeah. Um, we can certainly look at this area for doing something like that, as well as, as like the Mark crosswalks and maybe it's co in combination with each other. So there's a median or something, yeah, that physically yeah. slows down the traffic and also provides a refuge for pedestrians trying to cross um, Floyd Avenue there to get to the park. I and I guess it. the other thing that I didn't um, think about until just now is that on the, on the west end of um, Romans Park is a connection headed to the north to go to 
um, the school, and I feel like it's changed names, but it's a, there's an elementary school that's just outside of the picture on the um, northwest corner here. Okay. That would be that would be you know I think benefit like um, safe route to school situation. I don't think that there is a, a current continuous set of crosswalks that get kids from the south side of Floyd Avenue up to that school. But um, yeah, just like you're saying, having a refuge um, in the middle of the road there would be helpful. Okay. Yeah, we'll look at. Um, I think that um, is that Charles Hay right there. Maybe? Yeah, I think. Yeah. That, yeah, that's Charles Hay. Okay. Believe, yeah. That's on Downing. Correct. Yeah, that's kind of out, out to Downing. Yeah, so maybe this this stretch yeah. here, we'll look at that um, and incorporate the school area as well. So you have the walking patterns there. Great. Okay. So I'll follow up with Mr. Sanders, um, and then uh, Sergeant McKay, are you open to doing some of this enforcement? Yes, that's okay. not an issue at all. So we'll we'll get on that. Great. Okay, and then I'll pass that along to Mr. Sanders too. That to slow down and tell his neighbors to slow down too. <laughs> Good message there, Director De Andrea. So thanks again for um, the city going out there and and uh, tending to this matter. Um, you know, on behalf of of the committee and also Mr. Sanders on that. So I, I think he's going to appreciate the effort that was put forth, and with the uh, the enforcement from the police department that should hopefully hopefully bring down those speeds and um and in the future here so so thank you again for that um any anything else just to finish that topic off from the committee i got a quick question for maria are you going to post or how are you going to get the educational uh information out to residents and the commuters on floyd place that the speed limit has been reduced to 25. Yeah, with um, Guy leaving, that's that's fallen to me. And I uh, had an initial <coughs> conversation with communications, but um, we haven't done too much more with that. So I need to get back in touch with them and do more of an educational campaign um, to the entire city. So anything that's not posted is now 25 miles per hour. Um, but were you thinking maybe like a specific notification to these guys before they, or the Floyd Place people before we do enforcement? Yes, I do. I think, yeah. I think we should, if it's only 58, you know, residents, mm -hmm. that should be fairly easy to at least do a mailer. Or, uh, I don't know what the communications has in mind for notifying the community of the reduction of residential yeah. speeds. It was going to be more, you know, generic, but if we're going to do enforcement, then we should probably notify these people of the change because it won't be a signage change. It'll just be, you know, again, that de facto, if it's not signed, then it's 25 miles per hour. Okay. So we'll, we'll give them a heads up and I'll get you the um, notice so that you know that it's been, that it's been mailed. Okay. We can do this selective enforcement on Floyd Avenue. Mm -hmm. So we'll get yeah. that going. Okay. Um, Maria, I was just noticing this morning um, on Eastman, um, it's also right by an elementary school. I can't think of the name right this moment, but it's um, between Delaware and Alati on Eastman. And so it's also on that approach to Cushing Park. This posted sp speed limit right there is 30, which seems weird, right? With that elementary school right there and the park. Um, and that's definitely residential, so. Okay. On that, Eastman? Yeah. Bishop okay. Elementary. Bishop, on, yep. Yeah, it's on Dartmouth and Eastman. Yeah, we've we've got to look at all of our signed 30 miles per hour. If we do have them on a residential street, then we'll probably be removing those. But places like you know Floyd Avenue, Dartmouth would remain at what they're signed. Okay. But yeah, Eastman. So we'll we need to look at that because they probably went up, you know, somebody wanted a sign and and uh they kind of get put up sporadically. Okay. Okay. Um, again, any, anything else from the group before we move on to our next agenda item? I uh, just want to say thank you to Maria for following up on this. Uh, I know this is 
uh, some that's important to the citizens. And, you know, there's a former member of this committee that lives on Floyd Place as well. And he had brought that up years ago. So, you know, something that's not a new thing in the community, but, uh, you know, the traffic's increasing and, uh, you know, uh, that work that was done before, I'm looking through some of the old uh, minutes and things. I haven't found the presentation uh, the guy brought up yet, but uh, you know, that, that was some good work on that. And, and uh, it'll be interesting to see here how this 25 mile an hour, um, you know, adjustment that we've done here will roll out with the city. So uh, just looking forward to hearing more about that. But thanks for revisiting this and following up on it. Well, that's good to know. I didn't realize it had been an issue or talked about previously. So maybe in that letter, that notification, I'll give them some of that, this background data so that they know what we've studied. And it's not just about the 25 miles per hour, but also that we've looked at the volumes and the speeds there. So I can, I'll do that. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you everyone for their comments. Uh, with that, let's move on to our next agenda item. Just in case you wanted to look at all those uh, specifics. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Yeah, that is a, a very thick package there. Notice <laughs> that there. So, all right. Uh, our next agenda item is regarding snow removal enforcement. Uh, so again, this was brought up, I believe, at our last ETAC meeting there. Uh, some areas that uh, I think Member O'Connell had, had identified as being kind of lax in terms of some snow removal. I believe it was at the 7-Eleven uh, near Dartmouth and Broadway, that intersection there too, as well as um, some snow removal would be on the south side of Dartmouth as well too. Mm -hmm. And in those uh, bike lanes and, and just the city getting their arms around that to ensure that we've got a, a clear path as, as soon as uh, possible, if we could, in those sections there. So uh, Director D'Andrea, it looks like you've put together a response to this from the city. Um, so again, I can uh, let you walk us through that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just um, I followed up with our code enforcement supervisor to inform him of the concern at the 7-Eleven there. And so they um, are going to monitor that area. They do give first, I included here in the packet that um, the actual language from the code is that they do give a notice to people first so he wasn't sure when I spoke with him of whether they had received a notice or not. So the first step would be is if they haven't, that they would receive a notice. And then the next time that they would be served um, and receive a fine or whatever the next step would be. Typically he said that once they receive the notice, people are businesses and homeowners are good about going out and clearing the land or clearing the sidewalk. And so you can see here, um, Code enforcement had provided a couple of uh, council responses about how many notices they've given out and that they're actually being proactive about doing that, but they will also respond um, to a citizen complaint. But most of those are really where it's an officer um, initiated enforcement where they're driving around after a snow violation 24 hours to make sure that people are clearing their sidewalks. And then, um, so here's where their enforcement map. So it really is all over the city, but I don't see a blue dot at uh, Broadway and Dartmouth or what was the cross street again? Oh. Um, yep, Broadway and Dartmouth. Broadway, yeah, Dartmouth? Broadway, Dartmouth, okay. yep. So I don't yeah. see a blue dot there. Uh, so they'll be watching that. Yeah. So that'd be like right up there. Mm-hmm. I believe it's on the south, what is it, southwest? Corner? Southwest. Southwest, south. okay. Yeah. 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 Southeast is hamburger stand. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's hard to see. It looks like, but anyways, he's going to put it on their radar screen um, for the next snowstorm, which sounds like it might be this weekend. Um, and then you can see here for 2020 data that they've we've issued 479 notices 
And again, that was um, split where most of those were proactive by the code enforcement officer. And then we did respond to, um, looked into it a bit more about uh, what we do for bike lane snow and ice removal. And I'd like to introduce Janet Lundquist, who's our deputy director uh, for public works for operations and maintenance. And she prepared this memo and can speak a little bit to this issue. Good evening, everybody. Um, I just want to point out, um, we do try to um, focus on our primary streets, which are Broadway. Um, I always say this wrong. I think it's Gerard. Is that the way you guys pronounce it? And then Oxford and Dartmouth. Um, but as you guys, as Coloradoans know, we, we do get a lot of freeze and thaw on the south, um, south facing uh, or south exposure streets. And so sometimes we might get pushed off um, snow into the street and then there uh, might be some melt off and some icing. Um, so we do try to keep um, these four primary streets clear um, as much as possible. And then um, every other street we handle um, secondary with um, within 20, 24 to 48 hours of a snowstorm. And then um, we do try to circle back and check those routes. Um, if you guys are ever um, locating a, a, a location where you might see a little bit of ice damming or something like that, um, please feel free to shoot us an email or give us a call. We'll go clear that up and then um, flag it as a spot that we're seeing it more frequently um, so we monitor it more. Um, and I know a couple of you guys had mentioned your avid bikers. Um, so if you guys see those with the bike lanes, please let us know. And then um, also um, on the, on the I call them trail, but it's bike lanes that are really separated by just a little hump of concrete with the delineators. Um, streets actually uh, doesn't maintain those because we don't have the equipment to get in there just for the bike lane itself. Um, but we do coordinate with the parks department. Um, so if you, again, if you guys are noticing any ice damming or um, slicker spots than usual, please um, let us know and we'll kind of, we do uh, keep track over time and try to have those on our frequent flying kind of um, monitoring locations. And um, uh, we're happy to help um, if you're identifying things out on the streets. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Lundquist. Yeah, I just have to, as a general comment, I have to say, I, I know this is um, for maintenance concerns. It, it could be difficult at times in terms of the length, duration, and the intensity of a storm, of course, plays into this as well, too. So that, that adds to some of their challenges, uh, you know, for cleaning up the roads and, and keeping them ice and snow free. Um, but I did, as I mentioned at the onset of the meeting here, I, I did catch the, and I believe it was a city crew doing some removals there. They had a blade, I believe a, a, a truck, a dump truck and, you know, some traffic control on that south side of Dartmouth to go ahead and remove some of that. So um, I can, I've got a few of those pictures. I can, uh, I don't know if we could share the screen real quick here and try that Let's see here uh, let me know when you guys can see it so this is yeah looking eastbound as i mentioned from the intersection broadway dartmouth and i can move on here to some other pictures as well too Yeah, that's great to see, Neil. That's a, a chronic trouble spot. <laughs> yeah, and, and unfortunately, um, with uh, parked cars, that can be tricky for us, too. So we try to get yeah. that timing right where we can get in when the cars move and kind of get those crunchy spots where they build up around parked cars and whatnot. Um, but yeah, this is definitely ice dam cleanup. Um, it, where they're noticing that um, there is that buildup of where uh, the water can't really drain away as well or, or quickly enough to, uh, to, to make it where it's not icy when it gets cold again at night. Right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but as, as I mentioned, if everybody can see that, it, you know, I've got the, uh, there's a blade there. So you've got your truck there. So 
I'm just uh, conveying that the city, I, I did notice the effort that was put forth there. And that was following our last ETAC meeting. Um, that, so again, appreciating you guys taking our comments and, and really committing to that and conveying the message to whomever on that. So, but it, it was just the timing of it really um, just to find out there. But as I mentioned, uh, yeah, it, it's good to see that action happening there. So we appreciate that. Okay. You're welcome. And I'll pass on to the guys that um, you guys ap appreciate their work. They always like to hear um, from committee members and people from the public um, that, uh, that they're being helpful in their role here in the city. So I'll pass that me message on to the streets guys as well. Thank exactly. you. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome there, um, Director Lundquist. It's, it shouldn't be just complaints. If, if you guys are active and on top of it, we, we want to pass along those thanks for for attending to that and addressing whatever we're bringing up in our meeting. So this is clearly, um, you know, an example of that. So I just wanted to, to highlight that. Um, I'll stop sharing now and send it back to you, Director D'Andrea. Okay, any yeah. further questions on that? Or we can move on. Yeah. All right. So we did. Okay. Uh, oh. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Chair Sarno. Okay, I was just going to do the introduction there. Yeah, Director, please. But yeah. So this is the Mark Crosswalk evaluation, Bates Logan Park. Uh, this is again going back to our last meeting. Although going further back in time, I know this was brought up several years ago. I think Member Diedrich, you were part of that. Um, going back to the conversation, I think even member Ken Addison, you were there at the time. So this has been something that's brought up on, on occasion here. And um, Mayor Pro Temps here, I think he's uh, joined us in our meeting as well too. So this is something that I think a few and several in the community have brought to our attention as a possible way to, you know, just get some pedestrian traffic um, safely across Logan and surrounding the Bates Logan Park. So that's what this next topic is concerning. I'll let you take it from there, Director D'Andrea. Thank you, and I apologize for jumping in there. Oh, so, that's, that's fine, go ahead. I, but, so we did um, look at the, uh, I think the direction at the last meeting was to look at the intersection of Bates and Logan. Um, but I really, you know, we're, when we're trying to focus on the park as a draw for people to walk to and from, um, I, I looked at the entire perimeter of the park in relation to our marked crosswalk guidelines. So not just that intersection. So I'm recommending that three marked crosswalks be installed. And I'm gonna pull up the map so that we can see this a little bit easier. But, here we go. And so the um, looking here, this is the intersection of Bates and Logan. And so what uh, Logan is the north south street, Bates is the east west. And you have the situation where Bates traffic as it approaches Logan in both the east and westbound direction does have a stop sign. So and um, since Logan doesn't, we're recommending that the Mark Crosswalk be across Logan on the south side so that if people are coming, let's say from this neighborhood, they would cross the low volume street at the stop sign and then be able to cross Logan with the Mark Crosswalk. There would be advanced signage in both um, cases, both north and south of the actual crosswalk that we'd install as well to give vehicles as they approach it, knowledge that there's a Mark Crosswalk there. So then we also looked at this intersection and similar kind of idea where we'd mark it on the north side so that if this is Cornell, so if people were coming from this quadrant or this quadrant, they could cross Cornell. There is a stop sign both in the east and westbound direction, but not on Logan. So if car was coming this way, they would stop at a stop sign. Um, people could cross on that lower volume street from here and then cross with the Mark Crosswalk to access the park. Over here on the far east side of Clarkson, there is a informal path that's 
um, maintained over here by parks that I, I don't know what used to be in this little area, but there is a trail through here. And so I thought that would be another good location uh, for a marked crosswalk. Again, traffic doesn't stop on Clarkson, but it does stop on Bates as it approaches this T intersection. And then finally, we looked at this location because this, this is a small parking lot that serves the park. There is a sidewalk in front of these few homes and there is a sidewalk on the back side of this parking area. So I was looking at also putting in a, a crosswalk here, but the ped ramps right now really are not in good condition in terms of the way that they're oriented um, to the street to permit this crossing. There's also not a good place if you were in a, uh, let's say a wheelchair to access this sidewalk either at the end here nor within the parking lot to get up onto the sidewalk and access this trail. So I think what we're gonna recommend is that we do some improvements to those ped ramps, make that ramp connection, and then we would mark the crosswalk once we do the physical improvements to the sidewalks. So those are my recommendations. Be happy to answer any questions or talk about other locations that you might wanna consider. Great. I, I think uh, directed to Andrea, that's that's great. And it's it's I think expanded beyond what we initially had discussed in terms of, I believe at our last meeting, we had maybe looked at one uh, crosswalk, what would be I think at Bates Logan. So um, I think this is great that you've included the, the whole area as and and marked out those other locations as well like Cornell and Clarkson. Um, the question that I have though right now is that is the marked crosswalk, is that um, pretty much the treatment that we're looking at for, for right now or is there any, any other conversation regarding any, any additional signage or any, anything else, um, especially on Logan for that? Yeah, we would put up signs um, in, in both directions on the approaches to each of these locations saying that there was uh, it's um, marked crosswalk ahead. So it's a yellow um, diagonal sign mm -hmm. that you you put up. It's not the fluorescent yellow green that we use at a school. It's uh, for a specifically for a crosswalk or a trail crossing. Um, there is a uh, playground sign as you go northbound here on Logan that's adjacent kind of to the park. Um, and I believe there's one this way too, as you're going eastbound on Bates as you approach the park area. Okay. And uh, will you have those kind of state law yield vertical panels um, initially in the yeah. center of there to kind of just notify people? I think that there is that crosswalk there. Mm -hmm. Besides, of course, the the uh, you know the crosswalk itself. But I think that's uh, crucial to just getting the general public to, to understand that there's been changes there. I'll just defer to Chris Grath. Has, have those held up pretty well, our ones over the winter so far? Yeah, real well. We got one location that uh, it's next to a business with some large 18-wheelers. Uh, uh, those ones are hammering that one out, but every, every other location is doing really well. All right, that's good. That's good, yeah. I've seen more and more of that all around the city, so I, I think it's starting to register um, with with the with the public. So, just anecdotally, I think they really help. I see cars stopping for me that I guarantee probably would not have stopped before we put those in. So, I'm a fan. <laughs> yeah, seen them on on uh, Floyd. Avenue there and actually I was traveling westbound um, and there was a car in front of me but I was surprised that they actually stopped right but right at that crosswalk near the uh, Walmart there so you know I, I think it's yeah it's again it's I think it's a value um, for getting you know notice out there that yeah we've got crosswalks there and people are are starting to look both ways so Neil, do you mind if I ask a, a couple questions? Absolutely, go ahead, Mary Pro Tem. So I guess uh, you guys are already touching on one of the questions I have. So it may be for Sergeant 
uh, McKay, but uh, do pedestrians have a right of way on those crosswalks or do cars? I'm just trying to figure out what the rules are for cars slowing down when there is a marked crosswalk. Well, cars have to yield to the pedestrian, so you're correct. Pedestrians okay. have the right of way. However, you have to be cautious because you don't want to have that false sense of security. Right. Well, people think that they have that right away and their cars are, re although they're required to stop, doesn't mean they always do. Okay. And um, I appreciate that, Sergeant McKay. So I, I think the other question, actually, I'm going to have a third question, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the, the red stripe there, um, Director DeAndre. Uh, so I, I think the north end of Pennsylvania those are really narrow cross or sorry sidewalks. So, making that ADA compliant is that feasible with such a narrow uh, sidewalk? And I can't recall if it is on the south end as well. But yeah, it you're right. It is pretty narrow, and and even if we did do something at the end, it goes into grass. So I think what mm -hmm. I was looking at, but these two ped ramps, they're conflicted with um, some inlets for stormwater. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking what we do is we'd cross them over on this side and then they'd have to cross again to get to right. the actual trail and do it that way. As So I um, might end up putting one this way to lead people to this pathway. So doing a marked crosswalk here as well, as opposed to having them go down this narrow sidewalk and really just end up in the grass. Okay. Yeah. And I was, I was, and actually the fourth one or the third is more of a comment. So both of the the green uh, areas on Logan, none of those none of those corners actually have ADA compliant ramps at mm -hmm. the moment. They're all yeah. I believe even the ones on Cornell are just still elevated. There is no actual ramp there, uh, and the ones right on Logan and Bates where I'm at, uh, there just the one on the southwest corner is actual ramp, I believe. Yeah. So. We, um, so yeah, these don't meet. You're you're right. They don't meet that. So, but I'm comfortable adding the mark crosswalks as a safety measure to get people to the park. My concern is that you know here we don't want to put wheelchair people, give them a false sense of security that they're going into something. Here they would know that already right. and have made accommodations, but here it's kind of a no man's land. So, but yeah. these will be on our list for priority. If not this year, then then probably next year to replace all these and upgrade these ramps. Okay, perfect. And then I guess just in terms of the timing for the crosswalks, what are we looking at? Um, As soon as so, it gets nice, so. So not February. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Director. Mm -hmm. Chris, do you have any ideas yeah. that usually Mayish we get nice enough weather to mark those? Yeah, as long as it's dry, you know, um, 50 degrees surface temp, which is not too hard when the sun's shining, we can burn down some thermal in some nice weather. So you guys are using thermoplastic for those, Chris? Yes, sir. Right on. Yep, that's 50 and rising for sure. Yep. Very good. So, um, yeah, with that, I, I think this is a great improvement. And uh, again, appreciate um, the city looking into this and advancing this. I have a Any, question. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question about Member this. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I love uh, walking over to this park. It's uh, in a, a nice distance from, from our house here. And uh, I'm, I'm just kind of curious on a street like Logan, uh, you mentioned that you would put up a little bit of signage for these crosswalks and put the crosswalks down. Uh, I know in other parts of town, we've talked about things about, you know, reducing the distance uh, for people to walk, or in some cases uh, we've installed, I don't know what they're called, so please forgive me, but these sort of vertical reflective poles or things like that in other places. Um, I, I assume there's some sort of, you know, volume uh, requirement for that, or maybe space requirements too, that I don't, I don't quite know how they come into play, but is that something that would be considered for this or, or how would something like that um, come into play here? Yeah, the, um, you know, we, we, I looked at the crash patterns and there's really nothing around the perimeter of the park. So I think that would be another step 
or to your point where the volumes might warrant that. I think this is um, with, and with the addition of the in street sign that says stop for pedestrians, excuse me, sorry. Um, with those additions, I think we'd be comfortable um, with those improvements. I'm excited that, uh, you know, we're moving forward on this. So thank you for the attention and uh, this would be great. Okay. Very good. Any other comments from the committee? Okay. Seeing none at this time. Thank you again for making this happen. Uh, let's move on to our next agenda item. Okay. Our next agenda item is for the US 285 and South Broadway uh, inter interchange project. Um, call that, but I think this has been a long time in coming. It's quite a change, a welcome change, I think, for that um, for that stretch of road. And we have some speakers here, uh, some to present the, the project to us uh, from what would be the city, and also from Atkins, who the uh, city is contracted with to design the the project. So I will let them take it away. Thank you. Can I um, can I share my screen real quick? Yeah, I'll stop, Jake. Go ahead. Can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jake Warren. I'm an engineer in the uh, public works department with the city. Um, and I am the project manager for the 285 and Broadway project. And with me tonight uh, from Atkins, uh, or rather we have two, two representatives from Atkins uh, tonight that are gonna be presenting with me and I'll let them uh, introduce themselves. Hi everyone, hopefully you can hear me. Um, this is Dan Little with Adkins. I am the uh, project manager for the consultant team. And hi everyone, I'm Jamie Urshambo with Adkins and I'm the lead traffic engineer. Thank you all for, for coming tonight, yeah. So <clears throat> I'll start us off. Um, just wanna give a little bit of background on the project. Um, the city and probably anybody that regularly uses this interchange has recognized that, that there's some major needs for improvements. Uh, its position in the heart of Englewood adjacent to the city's downtown business district means its success has a critical impact on the economic vitality for the city. Furthermore, the interchange provides regional access to and from the city for residents, workers, shoppers, and more. The improvements proposed for this project will be crucial to Englewood's continued development and growth. So in early 2019, staff submitted an application for the Denver Regional Council of Governments 2020 to 2023 Transportation Improvement Program. Upon being granted the funds, staff worked with CDOT to develop an intergovernmental agreement, which was presented to city council for approval on May 28th of 2020. This agreement, which is required for all federally funded local agency projects, sets the terms for utilizing the awarded funds. It dictates things like which agency will manage the project, which agency will be responsible for long-term maintenance, and when the funds must be spent. So following execution of the IGA, the city solicited engineering services through a public request for proposals. 11 different engineering teams submitted proposals and ultimately Atkins Engineering was selected as the most qualified firm. Atkins has been working on the project since December 
and has been busy establishing site conditions, generating traffic models, and researching environmental resources. So before I have uh, the consultant team dive into some of the details on the project, I just wanna go over some of the project goals. Uh, the first one being is to improve traffic flow on 285, primarily through the addition of um, one additional through lane in each direction. We also want to improve safety for all users throughout the interchange. We want to improve the aesthetics and branding of the interchange to create a gateway to downtown Englewood. We want to improve the multimodal experience and we wanna improve the drainage characteristics. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Jamie to go into some more detail. Thanks. Um, so what you're looking at here is the project study area for the interchange project, um, as well as in the yellow showing approximate construction limits, but just to orient um, you to the map you're looking at, Cherokee is off to the left um, and Logan um, to the right of the graphic. Um, what we're really looking at with this project is trying to minimize impacts to um, any adjacent property. So trying to keep everything within the right of way. And so currently, as Jake mentioned, we're um, collecting existing conditions on survey and right of way information. One of the other things that we've been looking at is some of the crash history. Um, so we got CDOT crash data from 2016 to, to 2020. And so within that three, four years of crash data. And there are about 372 crashes between Cherokee and Logan, not including the intersections of Cherokee and Logan. Um, so you can see, you know, for the most part, a lot of just property damage crashes, but there have been um, say some fatalities um, in the corridor as well as several injuries. In terms of crash type, um, one of the things I want to point out is um, that gray piece of the pie, which is side swipes. And so that is overrepresented on what we would expect on this type of corridor. I think for anybody that's um, been in the area, I think you understand why that is overrepresented. Um, the lane drop um, in both directions, as well as some of the close access spacing creates those issues for side swipes. <clears throat> Um, as well as looking at, you know, the approach turn and broadside, those tend to be um, intersection related turning crashes that tend to be a little bit more severe. Um, and then we also did have seven crashes in, um, involving bicyclists and pedestrians in the corridor. And so we'll be using this data to um, dig in at, as we start to identify improvements, but looking a little bit more at some of the um, Crashes by access location, you can see, you know, at, at Bannock, we have that left turn um, that's there. There's quite a few left turn crashes that are happening there um, during some times of the day. There aren't many gaps for people to turn. So people, you know, may be turning at times when they don't have as much space as they think they do. Um, at Sherman, um, there's quite a few crashes. Um, we've got a lot of, uh, left turning crashes, um, broadsides. Um, there was one fatality at the Sherman um, intersection from a side swipe, as well as the, the overtaking turn. And what that is, is for people that are traveling eastbound on 285, and then you have the Broadway ramp that, that merges in. If people are trying to turn right from the, the 285 through lanes across that ramp, and that's where those conflicts are occurring, which is um, a safety issue. Um, and then other items of note are the pedestrian crashes and those locations are shown with the green um, stars. So we had two at, at Logan, two at Sherman and, and the two at Sherman um, occurred on the west leg. So um, there's currently no striped um, crosswalk there. So I think people may think they have the protection of the traffic signal and, and don't actually have that. Um, as well as three crashes at the um, westbound ramp and the Broadway intersection. And so we'll be using this information, as I said, in the design um, to inform, you know, how to make some improvements in, in each of these locations. Um, so thanks, Jamie. Um, 
We're going to talk here next about some of the interchange options that we're considering for the proposed improvements. So when we look at um, interchange options, we're looking to meet the project goals, address the, uh, the safety and the traffic um, considerations that, you know, Jamie talked about um, for the intersection and then improving, you know, intersection geometry and those types of things. So the first alternative that you see here is really an alternative that matches the existing configuration of the interchange, which we call a, um, a diamond interchange, um, which is what you see on the screen here. This generally matches the existing location of the ramps. The ramp intersections with Broadway are in a similar location um, under this alternative. Um, this is probably the um, most economical alternative because it's able to use a lot, utilize a lot of the uh, existing infrastructure of the ramps without having to do you know, some reconstruction and potentially save some money on that. Um, some of the things that you'll see under this alternative and some of the other alternatives that we will be looking at are um, geometric improvements such as right now the ramps have very sharp um, what we call diverge angles as you leave 285. So if you look down in the um, southwest corner of the interchange, for example, that ramp for eastbound exit to Broadway right now has a very sharp angle. And what you see in this design um, flattens that angle out so you're not leaving 285 at such a sharp angle. Um, and then it uh, comes back to the same location on Broadway. Um, some of the other things that are similar in all the alternatives would be for um, um, example, as Jamie talked about, the Sherman Street intersection has a significant amount of um, crash history. CDOT's studied that intersection multiple times um, in the past. They've made improvements to try to address some of the issues, but as part of the project that the agreement is that that intersection um, traffic signal will be removed um, and the access um, will be changed at that location. So that's a closure of an existing intersection. And you'll see, we've got some slides later on that we'll delve into that a little bit more detail because German Street is obviously an important corridor. Um, so let's, uh, let's go to the second option. So the second option we did was, it's similar to the first one, it's a di uh, diamond interchange. Um, we call this one a tight diamond. So what you can see here in the screen is we've moved the ramp intersections with Broadway closer to the bridge, um, so it's much tighter. This has an operational benefit of being able to um, coordinate the signals um, better for, for traffic operations. The things you'll see in this alternative are additional buffer space between the, the ramp um, and the residential properties on the south side. And then on the north side, it's squeezed in a little bit, not quite as much, but there's still some bu additional buffer space to Little Dry Creek um, properties within that location. Um, so it does, does create a little bit of extra space in there. Um, this does require some additional reconstruction from the first alternative. So it's probably a slightly higher cost potentially than the other, the first alternative. Um, and then the third alternative, um, just to uh, make sure that we're covering all our bases. This one here is what we call a single point urban interchange. Um, and um, this one has the tightest configuration, um, creating the uh, buffer space um, outside. This is a significantly different um, configuration than the diamond interchange. It functions as one traffic signal for the ramps and movements, and it has a much more efficient um, traffic operations. Um, and um, I would, the other thing I'd say about this alternative is that it has a significantly higher cost than the other alternatives. And potentially, we haven't uh, completely costed this, but potentially more uh, cost than we even have budget for at this time, because with the the configuration, the extra bridge that you see here, um, the tightness to 285 adds a bunch, of, a lot of walls in this whole alternative, but certainly something we want to make sure we're studying the, all the alternatives. So um, that's uh, the other alternative we looked at. Um, moving on to um, one of the important goals of the project is um, 
the multimodal considerations. And the starting point for us is the previous work that um, the city did back, I think in 2015, the completion of the walk and wheel uh, master plan. And we actually have the consultant on board on our team that did that master plan, OV Consulting. Uh, I believe Beth is on the phone or on the call here today. So if we have questions, um, they're available to help us. But um, the key I would say here, this is a map out of that walk and wheel master plan. And what you'll note here is Sherman Street is a, this is identified significant north south corridor for bikes and uh, pedestrian movement within the city. So Sherman Street is um, identified as a bike boulevard and it's also identified as an improved pedestrian corridor. Um, and we will have some some more conversation about that. And as you, you heard earlier, we're we're removing the traffic signal at that location. So um, we have to make sure we have that consideration. And then Broadway itself is also a significant uh, corridor, obviously for uh, multimodal bikes and pads. And it's identified in the master plan as an improved pedestrian corridor as well. Um, next slide, Jake. So this here is, um, some considerations specifically to the Broadway Bridge and the reconstruction of the Broadway Bridge and the approaches up to the bridge for uh, multimodal sidewalks. Um, as I said, Broadway is a improved uh, priority pedestrian corridor. So some of the things that we, we know we have to incorporate into the project are um, making this a much more pedestrian friendly environment than it is today. Today out there you see the sidewalks are very close to the, the roadway, they're very narrow, um, the crosswalks um, um, aren't, uh, I would say, great. And actually, as Jamie identified earlier on in the crash data, there was a couple of pedestrian accidents at this ramp um, on the um, north west corner. So what you see here is we'll be looking at separating sidewalks from the roadway to create a you know a lower stress environment, more pedestrian friendly. Certainly looking at improved roadway crossings, crosswalks across the ramps. Um, and then what you see over here on the right, kind of at the top here, is some some different considerations of the bridge typical section that we'll be looking at. We know we need to. Um, it's much more friendly to walk across the bridge if you've got some separation to the roadway. So some features, you know, in addition to just looking at the width is creating some some buffer there. Either we do it through bollards or um, planters or some sort of a, you know, physical separation across the bridge to uh, to make that an improved walkway. Um, and the other key consideration, as Jake said before, is we'll be looking at um, and working with other groups within the city about wayfinding signage to the downtown area and improve lands, you know, landscaping and aesthetics just to make, we know this is a focal point within the city. It directs folks to downtown as well as the medical center. So um, we'll be looking at wayfinding as part of the, the project in this area as well. And then, as I said before, um, a key consideration of this project is the closure of the intersection of Sherman Street and US 285. Um, so we the traffic signal will be removed and we're looking at and we'll be having multiple conversations with um, property owners, the Safeway um, business, as well as other businesses in this location as far as their operations are concerned. We've already had some conversations with the property owner of the bookstore, but um, and we'll have to get with the fire department, but about exactly what the configuration of this closure looks like um, so that it, it accommodates all the needs. And we understand there's a, still some more work to do, but the, the traffic signal in the, ag, in the uh, intersection itself um, is gonna be removed. So from a multimodal pedestrian bicycle um, consideration, as I said, this is a bike boulevard, um, improved pedestrian corridor um, that we do have the benefit of the close proximity to Little Dry Creek, the trail, so we can divert uh, uh, bikes and peds down to the trail underneath uh, 285 along the existing trail and then route it back up on the north side back to uh, Sherman Street. So that's that's kind of the big picture of that. There's obviously some design details of how we 
do crosswalks, how wide we make the sidewalks, you know, signing to get people directed to the to the alternate routes. Um, and I'd say because we have this map up here, the other thing that we're potentially looking at, and this was this was a location where there were some accidents, was the left turn into the Safeway um, Plaza potentially could be uh, removed as part of the project as well. And then um, they'd be diverted down Logan Street, but certainly have to have some more conversations with them about that. So I think oh, we have a project. So the project schedule, um, as Jake said, we've been working diligently um, since we've gotten started early first part of December, um, assembling data getting our surveying mapping started, getting the crash data, all of the analysis together. And uh, we're having a, our first public meeting next week on the 18th um, as a first step to uh, solicit feedback. Again, explain the project to the public, get some initial feedback. And then from that, we'll be continuing forward with um, the traffic studies, um, doing detailed analysis of pros and cons of the uh, in the uh, interchange alternative types that we talked about, and then looking towards uh, a recommendation, you know, in the, the May timeframe, at which point we would go back to the public again um, with another meeting in the May timeframe. Um, you, can, you can look at the schedule here. Uh, the other point I'll make is the construction is proposed for this project to be in the spring summer timeframe of 2022 is what we're targeting. So. Um, I think with that, we'll open it up to questions, comments from the, from the group. Okay. Very good. Thank you, um, Jake, Jamie, and Daniel for, for that presentation there. So I'll open it up to the committee here and, and just um, ask for some feedback here. Any questions at this time? Member Diedrich? Yes, thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you guys for uh, presenting tonight and uh, meeting with us this evening. We've had uh, quite the schedule, so thanks for hanging in there. This is an exciting project for us. I, you know, there's a lot of different things um, going on, a lot of moving parts, as you're aware, with this. And, uh, you know, I've got a few different questions. I know we're kind of early in the phase and there's lots of public feedback, so I'll try and keep it kind of general and not too <laughs> specific on should there be a crosswalk in this exact spot type of comments for you. Uh, but, you know, I, I like that you mentioned the multimodal stuff and, uh, you know, the pedestrian focus when I'm looking at some of these options, um, you know, options A and B, it's pretty obvious where the pedestrians go across on Broadway if they're walking north to south. Uh, option C, I'm not quite as clear as where the pedestrians would cross on that diamond uh, or single point urban. Um, so I, I'm a little bit uh, curious about that, and I've got a few questions, but I'll uh, I'll go one by one, if that's all right. <laughs> no, that's fair enough, and um, I recognize there's not enough detail there for the pedestrian crossings. That is a, a significantly different, um, I'd say, environment for pedestrian crossings with how they cross the ramps and get across. Um, there are separate sidewalks, um, you know, out, adjacent to um, adjacent to the roadway configuration and um, it um, we can come back I think you you make a good point we probably need to come back with a enlarged graphic that shows how the pedestrian crossings would work in that um, in that interchange type because it is a little bit different and I think potentially there's you know what we like to look at is um, <clears throat> exposure points when we look at the uh, crossing so if there's additional, um, you know, like free rights or uh, those types of things, the considerations that we would look at when we compare the, the different alternatives. And, and Dan, I was just gonna add the same thing. Um, you know, one of the main differences between this one and the diamond interchange is, are the number of times that pedestrians have to cross, you know, higher speed ramps. So, um, for each side, you're crossing, you know, four different times as opposed to two over a diamond. So that is definitely a consideration um, from a safety standpoint <clears throat> for the story. Okay. 
Yeah, and I've, I've, I'm going to look up a few examples, and I know this is kind of an early sketch up. It's not the detailed plan what it would look like. So, I, you know, thanks for, for explaining that a little bit to me. Uh, you know, some of the things that I, I like about the other options and, and even in, the, you know, just some of the images that you guys showed. Uh, I'm looking at the gateway to downtown slide. Uh, I think it's a couple below this one. Um, you know, I've, I understand the city has a, a certain budget for, you know, building a bridge. We can't make it as large as a park necessarily, but I like that uh, some separation between the traffic and the pedestrian side and then, you know, adequate space for, you know, pedestrians to move comfortably in, in both directions. Uh, you know, just thinking, uh, Right now, we're all supposed to kind of distance and, and wear masks and, and keep some distance, but generally, too, lots of people in the neighborhood with dogs uh, and, you know, to give them enough space and for them to walk side by side, uh, either direction or, you know, bicycles comfortably um, to move through there. Although I don't know what sort of uh, bicycle traffic is currently there, but uh, I, I like that separation uh, between the traffic that's in, in some of those examples you provided. Uh, with regard to the Sherman Street, and this might be a question more for uh, Maria, um, as part of, you know, I'm looking at the Sherman Street intersection closure slide, yes, and the bridge over Little Dry Creek, that is the Sherman Street Bridge, you know, with some of this discussion of terminating the stoplight there or preventing traffic from going each direction, is have, has the city considered removing that part of the bridge? Because I think that could provide some better options maybe for some of the pedestrian ramps to connect to the trail there as well if the bridge is not really necessary. I know it's kind of expensive to remove, but um, it's kind of curious. I guess, Maria, do you? Yeah. I can speak to that. I think Jake's been working on this a little bit too, or looking at that bridge. Um, we do have a uh, storm conveyance underneath there as well. So we'd probably would leave that in place or at least, you know, we'd have to replace it with some sort of drainage structure. Um, but really, yeah, this, this becomes a very much more low volume road. What we could look at, you know, is potentially doing like the bulb outs to make that crossing more pronounced um do something like that either with this project or as a separate effort and jake anything you want to add there or that you know of yeah i mean i would i would just say that's not something that we would look at as part of this project um we didn't touch on it too much but uh we do have a, a limited budget and rem, you know removing another bridge is is really outside the scope of this project so it's it's not something we're really investigating but it's definitely something you know we could consider down the road. Um, I have a question. Thank you for that. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, Chris. I, you probably have more questions. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead Tiff. Um, I'm just no, curious um, with the Sherman and 285, are vehicles no longer going to be able to access 285 at all from Sherman? Correct. Okay. Yes, we would. Um, from Sherman to 285 would not. Um, and what you see on the north side, and that's just a potential option that we were considering is potentially maybe from 285 moving in and we're doing that just in consideration of deliveries for Safeway and some of the businesses up there that maybe that's the only way they can get in there. But um, none, none of that is necessarily set in stone until we have some more coordination with like fire and you know, the fire department and some other things, but certainly, um, yeah, access from, from Sherman Street would be uh, restricted. Thank you. Thanks. I've also got a question here um, in terms of, and I know this is again, very conceptual and very early in the process here, um, but in terms of right away acquisition, um, is that something that pretty much we're staying within the existing footprint right now. Is there a substantial amount of right, right of acquisition? Because I know that's also drives the cost of the project at times too. Um, Jake, maybe if you go back to um, one of one of the, alt, like the, go to the alternative A. So we don't have an answer exactly yet, but I'd say the areas that we are 
concerned about would be the um, south side of 285 by Bannock Street, where that ramp comes off. There's a property there that's very close to um, the highway. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we're certainly going to try to stay out of there. And I think sliding the ramp down the way you see it drawn there potentially helps us. But um, that's one area we're concerned about. And then at Bannock Street on the north side, um, there's some, there's a landscape area in there um, next to that plaza that potentially we could be um, outside of and getting into that landscape area. That's another area of concern. And then I'd say the other key area would be the bookstore um, on the, yeah, the east end of the project by Sherman Street. Um, just the way that that ramp comes down and how close it is to the bookstore there. Um, and they do have a sign there that's just, it's an area of concern. I won't say whether we do or don't have right away there, but those are areas that we're looking at. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, Dan. And it's yeah, very typical in, in um, an environment such as this and, and uh, attempting to kind of retrofit this and th those tie-ins, I know they can be uh, very critical to uh to making that all work so appreciate you walking us through that sure sure good um this is just pretty much a general question that i have and i, I think this would be for director d'andrea again but um and thanks dan for putting up or it might have been jake but putting up that schedule uh, for the project as well too i'd like to continue to have you know at, at least some um feedback or continued collaboration between the committee and the city as these plans are continue to be developed and maybe further down the road, whatever options, um, whether A, B, C, and, and how that's moving forward. So uh, just again, looking to the future and yeah, the, the public meeting that I see is come up, coming up here, your first one, and you'll have a second one in May and a third one in October. So we know this is a long road to making this happen, but, um, and again, the city has been great with this, uh, continuing to reach out to the committee. But I just want to stress that and emphasize that we would appreciate just, you know, continued feedback back and forth and collaboration. That would be great. Okay. Yeah, we, um, I, I fully intend to have um, more meetings with, with ETEC down the road. Uh, I'm kind of tentative, tentatively thinking that We'll, we'll meet with you guys around the second and third public meetings, just because there will be, I think, some key decision points. Um, and, you know, we'd, we'd like your feedback at those times. So, yeah, we'll definitely be talking again. Very good. Thanks. For something like this, I imagine we'll have quite a few conversations, Jake. So um, th this is this is a beast of a project, but a, a welcome one, as we've, as we've mentioned here. So. Member Diedrich, did you have a another comment? Uh, no, nothing okay. else at this point. I okay. appreciate the work you guys are putting into it, and uh, look forward to the seeing what the public has to say in these public meetings. Bring the pizza. Well, this will probably be virtual, so I'm going back in time. <laughs> so, but yeah, this, this that will be uh, interesting as well, Chris. I agree with you on that in terms of uh, the input from the, from the public on that. So, yeah. Okay. Anything I, else? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I I just had a question. I, um, with um, it looks like all three of the configurations that you're exploring here, and particularly like the tight diamond and the um, urban intersection, it looks like there's um, some increase to the buffer. Uh, yeah, creates additional buffer space is one of the bullet points here. And um, I was curious to what extent uh, the city might consider uh, selling some of their right of way for development for other purposes. It looks like most of this land is pretty tied up, either you know surrounded by the creek there. Um, the place that looks most available would be over by Bannock and Jefferson, but that's, I think, surrounded by houses, so hard to get access. But it just occurs to me that, you know, we've seen that new development going in at um, Kenyon and Broadway, uh, uh, the apartment building there, and that perhaps it, it would be possible to sell some of the city's right-of-way 
um, to create more housing, which the city needs right now, or more commercial space, or um, you know, just some other use other than grass. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Maria can correct me on this, but I don't know if that's something that that we would look into, just because, um, as we alluded to in the presentation, this is, you know, we we kind of want this interchange to serve as a um, as a gateway to downtown, and I think. That, that green space and some of the trees that we have in the interchange kind of help to, 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 you know, make it an entryway to Englewood and sort of represent the city well. So um, that's kind of my, my initial reaction to, to your question, but I don't know if Maria feels otherwise. No, we'd have to look at the end of the project to see what land was available. Um, but yeah, to Jake's point, I think we really want to keep this um, I think it's just such a gem in terms of the amount of greenery that's around here than a typical interchange. And it looks almost like in a park setting that we wouldn't want to lose that. So there might be some pieces along here potentially that could be maybe combined with some existing homes to do some additional development. But I think we want to keep to some extent that park-like nature of the project and the way it looks now. Yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. I mean, it certainly is. Um, uh, you know, bit of a picturesque look, uh, or stereotypical picturesque anyway. I guess that I'm just thinking about, you know, looking at citizen surveys going back as long as I've paid attention to them in Englewood, uh, the two top issues have been cost of living and cost of housing. Um, so anytime there's an opportunity to create more housing, um, I'm, I'm excited about that as it's a, a big complaint for citizens. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Member yeah. Canadison. Oh, go ahead, Member Diedrich. Uh, yeah, no, I've, that's, uh, Greg, I'm glad you brought that up. I was kind of thinking the same thing, especially in, in some of these areas, you know, the the green space is is very nice. And, and you know, I, I think if we were gonna keep it, then I would wanna maybe give it some purpose or, you know, maybe work with the parks department about that. Uh, you know, I've definitely seen kids sledding down that hill when it snows next to that off ramp before. Uh, I know that's kind of popular with them among other things, but that's about the only use I've seen for that space because there's kind of, uh, you know, nobody really hangs out between the off ramp and, and 285 in there. So I think tightening that up would be good, uh, but also, you know, the green space, either giving it some purpose or to Greg's point, you know, maybe there's a way that we could fund this project to maybe make it more the way that we would really like it to be that's less budget constrained if we had an opportunity uh you know to go some sort of route with that uh you know even on alternative b with the tight diamond that would free up quite a bit of space um over there so just something to consider on thanks for bringing that up greg uh and and i'm also had a question about um when just curious uh when this is under construction will there be periods where these on and off ramps are closed down completely. And what, you know, have you done any analysis on that yet? And maybe that's a question for Jake. Yeah, things like like construction traffic control, you know, we're not diving into that level of detail yet. I mean, we, we really need mm -hmm. to select an alternative and, and figure out the design before <laughs> we, we start figuring out, you know, how we're gonna build it. Um, yeah. with, with that said, you know, if we had any ramp closures at all, they would be likely short term and um, you know off peak hours, like like at night or on the weekends, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, Dan, did you have any other thoughts on that? No, it's. Um, I guess what I would just say is typically, um, if you do close, the benefits of closing a ramp is you can get it done faster and cheaper. So we always try to trade that off with, um, you know, the benefits of keeping it open. So if there's an opportunity that really makes sense, and certainly that has to be vetted to the public, um, this group um, and others, if that makes sense or not. And there, and there also needs to be a, a real alternate route um, for traffic as well. So those are the things that we would think about with that, but they're, you know, um, it's always the, 
you know, if you do closures, you can make it go faster. So it's kind of like ripping the Band-Aid off, or do you want the Band-Aid to stay on longer and, you know, extends the construction. So those are, those are just kind of the things that we evaluate. But once we, like Jake says, once we have an alternative kind of identified and laid out, then we can get into those phasing options. And I think that's when the different considerations of whether, as, as mentioned, night work or even you know, weekends and, and the like come, come into play to maybe make that happen um, on these, these kinds of projects, I would say. So, right. yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for, thanks for clarifying a little bit. I understand we're kind of much too early to have that, you know, done. We don't even know what the plan yeah. is yet. So yeah. uh, <laughs> completely yeah. understand, uh, you know, al along with my comment about the, um, you know, potential for land use or, or you know, a different, better use for that land on the south side. Uh, you know, the pond and the bike path and things on the north side, I think, um, is is a great amenity that we have. I think it, in general, all that green space, as Maria pointed out, is, is a really unique thing that we have. It's kind of nice. And, you know, if you pull up on Street View, uh, coming eastbound on the off ramp on 285 you know it's a really the trees are beautiful they've got these great leaves it's it's something that's very unique to where we have and and so um, I, I completely understand that and i want to make sure you know if there's anything we can do to protect or expand on the north side of 285 where the bike path runs along little dry creek uh, you know i think that's a space that's underutilized and so i you know i would like to see that be you know incremental improvements there when we have an opportunity now i think would be great to look at because we've talked about some other broader plans in the city of connecting that trail to other places so um, you know if there's ways that we can you know pick off a little bit of that greater project right now while we're working on this i think that would be great to do yeah i think in, re in regards to the the trail connections and the, the little dry creek trail usage um you know, we'll, we'll be looking at uh, wayfinding signs as part of this project. And I think that's really where you're going to see the, uh, the biggest benefit to that trail usage, just in sort of informing people that are walking or biking by that that is something that's available and just, you know, promote usage that way. Yeah, All right, thank you. That, Jake. Thanks, Member Diedrich. Yeah, and I would agree. I think Jake, you were the you alluded to this earlier in regards to you know this being a gateway to the city and and looking at this and yeah, there is an opportunity to beautify this, make this something that's functional as well as you know provide some aesthetics and, and beauty to that because obviously from this interchange it just pivots to the north to where you know we have our main downtown, if you will, that's right there. So. Um, I think that's something worth looking at in terms of making it um, just an appealing, appealing interchange for motorists and, you know, they can pull off there and just enjoy Inglewood and Broadway and all those different businesses um, in the area as well, too. So that's a great consideration there for that. So, okay, any other questions, comments for our presenters here? Okay. Well, hey, thank you. Thank you again, Jake, Daniel, and Jamie for joining us this evening here and, and giving us this presentation and overview. Um, we look forward to, of course, collaborating with you guys in the future there. But, um, you know, I, I know you guys are quite busy and um, you guys at Atkins, I know you've got a lot going on, not with, just with Inglewood, but the other agencies as well. So thanks for spending some time with us. Absolutely. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Jamie. Okay, moving on uh, to our next agenda item. which would be the Oxford Avenue pedestrian bridge. Okay, is D Director Dandridge there okay? Yes, yeah, so Jake is gonna present this one as well. 
So I'll okay. let him uh, pull up some slides here. Great. Is Jake frozen? Oh, looks like yes. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. Sorry, I think I got, got disconnected there when I was loading up my PowerPoint. Let's see. Okay, everyone can see that PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. Good. <clears throat> um, so this is another project that the, the city is undertaking. Um, I'm gonna warn you guys, some of this might sound uh, repetitive with the last conversation and that's because this is another um, federally funded local agency project. Um, so that I will start. Um, so just to give some background, uh, here's an aerial view of the project site. Um, we have Oxford Avenue uh, right here. Um, so we're just east of Santa Fe and west of Navajo slash Windermere Street. Um, and right here in yellow is where we plan to install the bridge with this project. So <clears throat> this project was identified as a key recommendation for implementing the 2015 walk and wheel plan. Uh, <clears throat> in early 2019, staff submitted an application for the Dr. Cog Transportation Improvement Program. Upon being granted the funds, staff worked with CDOT to develop an IGA which was approved by city council on May 14th of 2020. And following the execution of the IGA, the city solicited engineering services through an RFP. We received eight, uh, eight responses with Wilson and company ultimately being selected as the most qualified firm. So Wilson's been working on the project since late December and has been focused on establishing site conditions and developing preliminary design alternatives. So just a quick overview of the funding for this project. Um, we got 1.6 million in grant funding uh, through that transportation improvement program. And with, uh, with that IGA, um, basically it's set up to, to have an 80% to 20% split of federal funds to local funds. And so we have a total project budget of 2 million. And our project goals for this project are that we wanna provide a safer crossing of Oxford Avenue near the Windermere and Navajo Street intersection. We wanna improve accessibility to the Oxford RTD light rail station, thereby promoting the use of public transit. We want to expand the Englewood bicycle and pedestrian network according to the walk and wheel plan. And lastly, we want to improve traffic flow on Oxford Avenue by reducing the number of pedestrians and bicyclists that need to cross the street at grade. So two alternatives uh, will be analyzed during the preliminary design phase of the project. Uh, the first is going to be a steel truss bridge, which is similar probably to most other pedestrian bridges you've seen. And I know there are examples of these that can be found on the South Platte River Trail and elsewhere throughout the Denver metro area. Now, the second alternative, which was proposed by Wilson and Company, is a cast-in-place concrete bridge. 
Now this design has uh, the benefit of creating a shallower structure depth, thereby reducing the amount of elevation gain necessary to get from the street to the bridge. This has significant impacts on the design from an ADA perspective and a bicycle rideability perspective. Another benefit of the concrete bridge design is that the bridge can be curved, which may improve some of the approach angles and further help with grade constraints. So with either of these alternatives, the consultant's going to review each of, <clears throat> each of the alternatives for compatibility with uh, these design considerations. And those design considerations being ADA compliance, bicycle rideability, roadway clearance, right-of-way constraints, impacts to existing infrastructure like the nearby retaining walls, the apartment building, um, the sidewalks and roadways. And we also need to look at connectivity, that being to the station, uh, the street sidewalks, as well as the future rail trail. And then lastly, we'll obviously have to, have to consider cost. So that's, that's really it for this presentation. Um, I'll, I'll just kind of leave this aerial view or, or plan view of the sort of favored uh, concept alternative and, and open it up to questions. All right. I think we're just having a minute to just soak this all in, Jake, right now. So yeah, that's okay. Take your time. Um, uh, been... So it sounds like you're kind of early in the Go design ahead. process. No, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so it sounds like you're kind of early in the design process. Um, you know, with the budget that you have, um, it sounds like probably nothing fancy or overly architectural is probably in the budget uh, for this sort of thing. But I'm, I'm curious, are you guys looking at doing something that spans the entire width or are you going to need to put supports in the middle for this that might affect the roadway underneath? Um, we, we are early on and, and really haven't gotten to analyzing that. And that'll, there's, there's a couple things we're gonna consider when deciding if we wanna put a pier in the, in the median on Oxford. Um, Ideally, we don't have one. Um, it's just better for aesthetics, and it, um, you know, at this point, we don't know whether it'll save costs or not. But um, it definitely helps from a constructability standpoint as well. We also, uh, if we put a pier in, um, you know, we got to design it for potentially being hit by a vehicle and that sort of thing. So even though it's it's just a pedestrian bridge, it's going to have to be pretty robust in this location. Um, there's, there's traffic control, control considerations when we talk about constructing the bridge with a pier. You know, this, this median in here is pretty narrow. So, um, you know, we probably have to close off at least these, these lanes closest to it just to get that built. But um, it's, it's something we're, we're definitely gonna consider. Um, we'd like to have it be a single span, but we'll kind of see what, uh, how it looks from a cost and constructability perspective. Uh, I'm excited about this. We've been talking about this for a long time, so I'm excited to see it moving forward. I'll we'll let some other people ask questions. So, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Member Addison. Um, yeah, I just um, I had a question. One thing that's come up at this location a lot is um, how the bike racks are perpetually full, and uh, we've had complaints. Um, of problems with um, bikes getting stolen, I think probably because there's not enough space to lock them up well. And so I just wondered on that, um, the edge, the right edge of this, um, if perhaps there would be um, a way to incorporate some space for uh, bike locks um, or you know structures to lock bikes to um, by that edge of the um, light rail platform there. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's something we can consider. I know uh, that was that was brought to my attention uh, a few months ago, um, so it's it's definitely something we can consider including in this design. Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't see why we can't consider it. That'd be great.
I just general as a general comment want to uh, again applaud the city for going after those, you know, Dr. Cog and different funding sources because I think it's really giving us the opportunity to advance a lot of these projects that felt like they were really far out there in the future, and you know to have just whatever that was twenty five or percent or of you know from the city and the the remaining remainder being. Um, just some grants and that, that kind of funding. I think it's again, great that I, I think I'm starting to see this as a common thing that the city's uh, using as an approach. And I, I really think that's a great thing. Yeah, it's definitely a, a, a good resource. And I think, um, I think we'll be looking at that down the road as well. As part of this, would you be removing the pedestrian crosswalk on the across o Oxford on the west side of Windermere? In the image here, it shows it's still on there. You know, that was something I was kind of, well, I had spoken to Guy Norris about that and was kind of gonna leave to him out like outside, basically leave it to him to take care of outside of this project. So. Um, it's not something we were really considering to do within this project, but definitely something we were going to look at, you know, as a result of the project. Yeah, I, I would just add, yeah, if we do that, we'd probably also then remove like the um, pedestrian cross countdown timers on either side to encourage people to use the the ramp. And again, one of the benefits that Jake mentioned was increasing the green time for Oxford. So when you have that pedestrian countdown timer, either here or here, you really reduce the amount of through, tra through traffic that you can move on Oxford when that button is pushed. So we'd at least remove probably this leg, including those um, modifying the signal heads on each side to accommodate that. Um, at, on this image here, it, you can see on the left side, uh, looks like it would connect to the rail trail that is, you know, perpetually <laughs> in work here. Um, on the right side, I am curious, uh, just for in the future, when we finally get to install that rail trail from Denver to Littleton, uh, you know, is it, I'm not sure how that would contemplate because of the light rail station and the ramp there, if what the long-term goal might be for the rail trail, but um, was that something that was considered in this design as well? Um, I'm, I guess I'm, can you, I'm, I'm not sure what the question was. Oh, <laughs> kind of yeah, sure. So, Are you just? Sure, yeah. So we've been talking about the rail trail kind of running north and south along essentially the light rail. And, and mm -hmm. there's a sort of long-term vision of it connecting more or less from Denver down, um, you know, to at least, uh, you know, Bellevue Park in Inglewood. And so, you know, on this image that's on the screen here, it shows on the left side, it, it kind of tees off and then stops maybe, you know, 30 feet from where you would turn right and go over the bridge uh, if you were heading up on the left side. And I've, I guess I was just sort of assuming that would be part of a future connection to the rail trail. Uh, and that was one of the longer term things, you know, we've talked about uh, a bridge eventually over um, 285 as well, connecting to that light rail station and something like that uh, in some previous conversations here. Um, so I was just, just wondering, you know, if that greater rail trail plan had contemplated it running more like it grid with Windermere versus being um, something that might change the uh, light rail ramps or something over there if we're doing some dirt work in this space anyways. Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> like you, you, what we have drawn here is essentially like the, the limits of the project. So, um, you know, we would, we would be looking at widening the, the sidewalk here to make it appropriate for both bicycle and pedestrian use. And, you know, we, we may look in under future projects at extending, you know, that that extra sidewalk with further up Windermere. And, you know, that would that widened sidewalk or multi-use path would would function as the rail trail along Windermere. So I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I I think so. Uh, 
Uh, just uh, another sort of very related point. We had talked about some bike routes along Windermere across, you know, Nassau and Mansfield um, through this part of town in a couple of previous meetings. So that was going to be my other comment was just making sure that it's, you know, going to have plenty of room to be bicycle and pedestrian friendly um, to support that sort of longer term use of that wonderful amenity of a bridge that we've been talking about for so long. <laughs> So, uh, Jake, going back again, uh, what, what is the timeline for this project again? I'm sorry, I missed that. Yeah, sorry, I was I, I trimmed that out of the presentation just because uh, I was hoping to keep this one kind of short. Um, the uh, so it's on a similar timeline to the 285 and Broadway project. We'll we'll probably have this under construction spring of next year, and there are. Um, there, are, there is kind of an X factor here just with right of way concerns, um, primarily on this, the south side here with this apartment building, um, we're, we're likely gonna have to acquire uh, some right of way to, to make both the, the connection down to the street work as well as allow for that future connection of the rail trail. and. Um, you know, this, this drawing is from Wilson's original proposal. Uh, but one thing we've talked about is that this, this, the bridge landing in this location is actually too far to the west. Um, it would, and it would put it in uh, railroad property, um, which is also leased by RTD. Um, and we, we want to want to avoid working with, uh, or trying to get right away from the railroad. Uh, as part of this project, just because that that adds a a ton of extra time to the to the schedule. So um, yeah, you know when we shift it over, we're going to end up putting ourselves in some of this apartment complex right away. And uh, so depending on how you know agreeable they are to this project, that that could either expedite or or draw out the uh, project schedule. Uh, yeah, that's um, that's kind of a known known issue, or can be in terms of you know working with the railroad and things kind of tend to slow down or almost to a crawl at times. Um, times for the many layers and facets of dealing with the railroad in that sense. So, yeah, it's it's understandable to try to navigate that in in a in a way that's more conducive to staying away from them as much as possible and and not having to go there in the first place. So I, I completely understand that, Jake. Yeah. Okay, um, any other comments at this time? The committee there, okay. Very good. Well, it looks like we've got a, another successful project on deck here. So appreciate this uh, presentation also, Jake, thank you for bringing us to, uh, to the table here. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Okay, with that, let's uh, move on to our next agenda item. Which, let's see here. Okay, Denver Inglewood Bikeway Flyer Final, Zunai Street Bike Lanes Proposal by City of Denver. Okay. Pretty good. Director D'Andrea, yeah. Yeah, just Go wanted ahead. to bring this to your attention. Um, this flyer has gone out. This is in the northwest portion of town on west of um, Santa Fe. And this runs from Zunai, uh, or excuse me, from along Zunai from Dartmouth Avenue up to Jewel, which is in Denver. And so Denver approached us about this idea of adding on street bike lanes to Zunai. Um, I don't have a good map, but they basically it's in 
the southern portion for maybe a block and a half, two blocks, it's Englewood on both sides of Zunai. And then it's Englewood is only on the east side and Denver is on the west side. So it is would be a joint project. And this is a meeting that's being held to just get feedback from the neighborhood um, because we would have to, in order to sign this and stripe the on-street bike lanes, we would need to remove parking from one side of the street or the other. And of course, then that hits Denver residents potentially against Englewood residents. And which side do we pick and how do we select that? So they have gathered some uh, data in terms of how many cars have been parked out there, how many driveways there are, how many spots in general. Um, but we think that's probably the biggest issue that we'll hear about is just, you know, you're taking away parking from me. So um, we'll be interested to see what happens. Like no decisions have been made. And um, I think we're just, again, looking for that input from the neighborhood before we move forward and making a decision. They would um, come through and repave that. So it would be all new striping with new paving on there. And that, um, I think the second one is just, yeah, it's the backside. So it shows that it was dual language that it was put out in. So that's two weeks from tonight, as a matter of fact. So if you wanna join, um, feel free to sit in on that, provide your comments. And then as we get more details about, you know, the actual striping plan, we'll bring that back to ETAC to share that with you and kind of the decision-making process. Great, looks like another improvement. Um, very good. Any, um, any comments on that one? Um, I think that would be a great improvement. I've ridden that, um, I've ridden Zunai through that part of town before and bike lanes would be awesome. Okay. Yeah, it's quite hilly, um, surprisingly. Yeah, yeah it really More is. More so than other areas of town for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and has the city, I mean, I'm, in terms of collaborating with uh, with with Denver, is, is that something that um, comes across? Is it somewhat seamless at times, Director D'Andrea? Is there challenges to that? <laughs> not not putting you on the spot, but it's almost like you know, I I'm just curious about the relationship with the city and both cities, Inglewood and Denver, and and hopefully, you know, it's there's some there's some good collaboration and that goes on uh, amongst both parties to make something like this work. Yeah, I I I, I giggle, um, but truly, you know, I think when we consider the what the desired outcome is is because people don't know that it's that side's Denver and this side's Englewood, so. Yeah. You know, we've got to set aside those kind of territorial boundaries and really focus on what's the best for this particular area and how do we best mm. achieve that. So, um, right. yeah, while there's de definitely some, oh, no, you're not going to do this to Inglewood and you're not going to do this to Denver. You know, we ultimately we want what's best for the neighborhood and we'll get yeah. to a solution for sure. We're right. we actually want to have that collaboration with both Denver, you know, Littleton. We're talking about those bike lanes that go down Windermere into Littleton and um, that we're going to stripe next year. So, you know, when you're a bike rider or a pedestrian or even a, even in a car, you don't know where those boundaries are. And so how do we make that transportation network as seamless as possible and, and work yeah. for everyone? Great. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, it's got its, its set of challenges there, but it's, it's necessary. And and just something, as you mentioned, it's kind of an improvement for the for the area as a whole. So that's that's good that we're doing that, taking that on. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other comments for this item? Okay. None from the committee for this time. Thank you, Director D'Andrea, for this, and we'll continue to kind of follow this there. Um, try to mark that on my calendar, although I. I know that's, I've, I've got to, I'll be skiing that day, but we'll see. But uh, let's move on to that next item. I believe that's it. This was just a yard sign that they also created that people could put in their yard. Um, I'll make this a little bit smaller here. 
So again, that was in two languages and I believe they've shared this um, and, uh, with some neighbors to put that out to notify people via um, yard signs that that meeting is coming up. So I think good. that's the last item on the agenda as far as action All right. items. Sure. All right. Well, then we'll move on to director's choice. Director D'Andrea, you have the floor. Again, um, just one item for me tonight. Uh, next Tuesday, we're going to be starting our preventative maintenance work in zone four, which is um, the area east of Broadway and south of Hampton. We'll be, our street crews will be working to crack seal streets in there in anticipation of a slurry seal application on those particular streets in uh, later this summer. So you may see folks down and about in that area from the city. And we're, we actually want to do it at this time of year because it's cold and therefore the asphalt cracks are actually at their widest. So we can fill them when they're, because when the um, asphalt heats up, it expands. And so when it's warm out, it actually narrows the crack and we want it at its widest when it's cold out. So between snowstorms, that's what our staff will be doing in streets. And that's all for me tonight. Very good, okay, excellent. Um, continue on with uh, some other people present from the city here. Uh, let's go to um, Deputy Lundquist. Um, I don't have anything further this evening. Um, thank you for letting me present tonight and I hope you guys have a great month. All right, thank you. Uh, Jake Warren. Jake, if you've got anything else? No, I don't have anything else. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, we got Chris Groth, Chris. Hey everyone, uh, nothing for me, Neil. All right, 50 and rising. Remember that, Chris, right? <laughs> That's it. Um, Sergeant McKay. It was an informational meeting, so thanks to all. Very good, thank you, Sergeant McKay. Uh, Tim Hoos. Hi there, uh, nothing for me. I was just here tonight to uh, listen to Jake's uh, presentation. I'm the Capital Projects and Engineering Manager for the Public Works Department. So just here to listen in and uh, get the information to you. It sounds like uh, everything went well and I appreciate all the feedback on the project for us tonight. Very well, thanks. Appreciate you, you uh, joining us. Okay, and Mayor Pro Tem Sierra. Uh, I guess the only thing I wanted to just say is that I most likely will be at that Zuni Street bike uh, meeting. So uh, I agree, I've been on that street and definitely would be beneficial to have bike lanes. So other than that, thank you very much everyone for staying late tonight. Yep, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. One quick question for you, Mayor Pro Tem, your backdrop, is, is that actually the Inglewood Grand? <laughs> it, it is the grand, yeah. I'm cycling okay. through different uh, Broadway signs for my Zoom background. Very nice. Thanks. You're making me thirsty. <laughs> All right. Appreciate it. All right. Um, moving on to chairperson's choice. So um, what I have right now is basically just um, for, the, for the members of the committee, uh, I will be going to the city council meeting, attending the city council meeting on February 16th, um, in case there's any questions for city council. At that time, we'll be, um, we'll be removing a member, uh, alternate member plasters at the time. And following that, if, if they approve that, city council does. And then I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe Pro Mayor Pro Tem, you spoke to this, but I think it would be perhaps May when we would begin the interview process for another member, May or June, or maybe I've-, I've, I've Yeah, no, no, I've Neil, that. you have that correct. So the interviews would happen sometime in May and they would get seated in July. And just FYI, Neil, uh, yeah. for, the, uh, for the removal of that, uh, of that uh, committee member, we have it on consent uh, a consent agenda. So unless somebody okay. may not discuss it at all. Okay. I'll, uh, yeah, and I know how that works. So just in case uh, somebody on city council has a question and right. I'll, 
I'll chime in at that time, but I, so I will be there in, in, in to attend that. So, perfect. yep, um, that's all I've got. So I'll move on to committee members choice. Uh, let's start with member O'Connell. Uh, nothing further from me tonight. I just wanted to thank everybody for the presentations. It was very informative. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Member Diedrich. Uh, I, I don't have any further topics for this evening. I'd, I'd like to say thank you to all, all of the who presented this evening. Um, you know, we went over a lot of things and uh, this was, I, I felt like it was a really good meeting. So appreciate all the hard work that everybody put into being prepared and, and providing all this information and really excited about some of these projects that are moving forward. Um, I, I will just say, I, I don't plan to discuss it tonight, but um, possibly at the next meeting, I, I would love to discuss uh, some of the outcomes or results of some of the uh, projects that we did last year around the June, July timeframe with uh, shutting down some of the streets in some of the areas near the parks uh, and just see kind of how that went or uh, if there was any feedback. Um, I, I know I'm kind of bringing that up again, so I don't intend for any discussion, but just wanted to give some people a heads up that I would like to talk about that in the next meeting. Um, and that's all for me tonight. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Member Diedrich. And thanks. I mean, I, I did uh, put out there in the um, correspondence to the group, to the committee, that if they could hold off on items due to the agenda and the presentations there. So I, I appreciate it, unless there was really something pressing, holding off on it until the uh, future meetings there. So thanks for that, Chris. We'll, we'll address that on, on the next uh, meeting coming up. All right. Member Ken Addison. Ready. I just want to make sure everybody knows um, that we're in the presence of a celebrity tonight with uh, Tim Hoos. I've seen you in the Frank on Main videos and they're pretty good. Um, so I want you to know I appreciate that. Um, if folks haven't seen it, they're on a variety of different social medias explaining different uh, maintenance that's going on in Inglewood. I, I do, in, in all honesty, I'm, I, you know, I was joking a little bit, but I do appreciate those videos. I feel like it's great to, you know, just uh, fill in inf information in people's minds about what's going on in Inglewood so that they are not suspicious about something going wrong. So I, I appreciate those public education campaigns. Um, and then uh, I, I also wanted to mention, um, Director D'Andrea, you mentioned that small little connector on Bates where the street doesn't exist between Clarkson and um, Emerson Park. Um, that was uh, one of Lad Vostri. Um, he, he said that that was one of his favorite improvements to Englewood <laughs> that he did was making that little connection there. Um, so I feel like that's a fun little bit of trivia about that. Um, curious little spot, which is, I think, a pretty fun little connection um, if anybody's been able to make it. So I, I have no other actual business to talk about. Thank you all. All right. Thanks for your comments, Greg. Appreciate that. All right. Well, um, thanks again, everybody, for coming. There was quite a lot of information there to, that we cycled through, but I think it really went well. And, and as everyone has mentioned, very informative. So look forward to seeing everybody here in a month. Uh, looking at the, that what would be prospectively, uh, looking at the 11th on March 11th there too. So, so thanks again for everybody for coming, staying warm this weekend, especially cyclists out there who <laughs> continue. So have a good time, everyone. See you next month. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye,